Hello, happy Monday. Oh God, this is a recording and I'm nervous. Hi everyone and welcome to Aaron's Variety Hour. I'm not sure if this thing is actually going to go an hour, but I'll do my best to make it there so that I can live up to the name of Variety Hour. And as I said, it's a variety hour, so we're going to talk about a variety of things. Uh, I'm extremely honored this year because this is the very first time I've been able to uh, do the opening keynote at RailsConf. Uh, every other year I have to, I always give the, the final keynote of the conference, and this is the very first time I've been able to give the opening keynote at RailsConf. Uh, though I do think it is kind of weird that if you go to the website, uh, and scroll down, you'll see that I'm, I'm very last on the web page. Now, I'm sure that this is just an oversight, like a small oversight by the organizing committee. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure we can get this like cleared up later, but it, it's really great to be the very first uh, opening presentation. Uh, now, David usually does the opening keynote, but since it's my turn this year, I thought I should change my headshot to something a little bit more appropriate. Uh, so I took a new headshot photo, and this is, this is what I am going to start using from now on when I uh, give talks at places. Uh, the other thing is that uh, since I won't be able to see David's presentation ahead of my presentation, and that's because, and I can't stress this enough, uh, I am the opening keynote this year. Uh, since I won't be able to see his talk, since I'm opening, um, I won't be able to make any jokes about it. So I've decided that this year what I'm going to do is try to guess the things that he'll say and then uh, see if I can make some jokes in advance. Um, so the, the first thing, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's going to talk about uh, coming in 2020. I heard that Basecamp is going to be starting a new email service called Hey.com. And I'm really excited about this, but I guess from what I understand, they plan to monetize the service by charging money for email. And I think that's really great, but I don't understand why anyone would pay money for email. Uh, people send me email all the time, just constantly, and I, I don't pay for any of it. Uh, so I'm not sure why people would pay for that, but uh, I wish him best of luck. Uh, the other thing I'm pretty sure is that most folks are doing a lot more uh, remote working these days, and I think that's really great. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people out there who are new to doing remote work. Uh, and I'm also really happy that David and Jason decided to release this book at such a steep discount. They, they wrote a book about remote work, and I haven't actually read the book yet. Uh, but I'm going to. I really plan on it. I ordered a copy. I'm going to read about this. And the reason I want to read is because I, I too, would really like to work from home. Uh, I mean, I would really like to work from uh, David's home. It looks very nice. Uh, <laughs> now, as, as you no doubt noticed, uh, RailsConf is not in Portland this year due to the outbreak of COVID-19 in the United States. And I'm pretty sad about that. Um, I love going to Portland. It's, this is really too bad. Uh, I was looking forward to seeing everybody in Portland this year. Uh, and it's so close to Seattle, so I can just drive and I don't have to like, you know, fly down there. So I, I really like that. Uh, the other thing is that uh, I think that I, I love that show Portlandia. So I'm so happy if I can visit Portland, which the show is about. But honestly, one of the reasons I think that the show is really funny is because um, Seattle, where I live, is so similar to Portland, uh, and the show could really be about either place, but I guess Portland got stuck with it, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, this year, as I was saying, we're doing the conference remotely this year, uh, and doing a pre-recorded talk is like a really difficult thing for me to do. I usually don't do pre-recorded talks. Um, it's really important for me to get feedback from the audience. I really need feedback from the audience when I'm giving a presentation. That way I can adjust my presentation if I'm going too long or too short. Um, and also I get extremely nervous when I'm giving a talk and the feedback from the crowd like helps me actually calm down when I'm on stage. And unfortunately, like since I'm, I'm pre-recording this, I, I feel really nervous. Uh, but I decided I would try to deal with this by attempting to give a presentation 
uh, ahead of time and record it in Zoom. Aaron, are you started already? You're, you're muted. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? All right, sorry about that. Let's try again. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Aaron's Variety Hour. Uh, I'm really happy oh. to be here. Aaron, I think uh, you, you have a color palette on your screen still. Oh, really? I don't, I don't see anything. Is there? Yeah, it's like one. It's... OK, one sec, one sec. Uh, that, is that OK? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. OK, OK, let's do this again. Uh, OK. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Aaron's Variety Hour. Uh, hopefully, this will be an hour long. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I'll, uh, can you all mute if you're, if you're not on? Like, can you? <laughs> Somebody's getting a phone call. Can you mute, please? All right. OK, let me start over. Welcome to Aaron's Variety Hour. I am so happy to be here. Uh, Hopefully this will be an hour, but okay, I'm not sorry, sure. I'm, sorry, I'm late. Uh, uh, I'm, what did I miss? <laughs> I've been trying to start. Okay, I will. I will start over. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. All right. I don't want to miss Hi, any Hi everyone. Puns. <laughs> Hi everyone. Oh. Welcome to Aaron's Variety Hour. Shoot. Oh. I'm sorry. Wrong meeting. Uh, okay, <laughs> let me try again. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to Aaron's Variety Hour. This may be an hour, but I'm not sure. <laughs> now, when that didn't work, I decided that I would try to give the talk in front of my cats. Welcome to RailsConf. Welcome to my very first opening keynote at RailsConf. Come here, buddy. Welcome to RailsConf. Come on, buddy. Now, when that didn't work, I decided that I would try to give a presentation on Animal Crossing. Now, since it was way too hard to give a presentation on Animal Crossing, I decided to just do the format that I'm doing right now, which I guess is a late night TV show host. Uh, and I will just start adding laugh tracks to animals and make myself feel better. Now, before I get into the stuff that I actually want to talk about for this conference, uh, I want to tell you all about my, my productivity strategy. Uh, my productivity strategy is uh, procrastination. So in order for me to focus on building a presentation, I need to put it off until I absolutely can't put it off anymore. Uh, and the reason I do this is because it gives me hyper focus. I, I have to focus on the task since I'm required to focus on it. Like I know that there is a particular deadline. I have to be up in front of an audience. Uh, this helps me really focus on uh, preparing my presentations for people. Uh, however, this, this strategy also comes along with a lot of um, extreme guilt. Now, I'll, as I'm procrastinating, I know I should be working on my talk. I know I should be making this presentation, but I'm not. Uh, so in order to relieve my guilt for procrastination, I have to fill my time with things that I deem to either be uh, more important than the task that I at hand, more important than the thing that I'm doing, uh, or it has to be something that's more fun. Now, uh, I call this Procrastination Project Management, or PPM for short. And actually, I take it very, very seriously. In fact, I meticulously plan out my procrastination. These projects are actually planned procrastination projects. Now, I had planned out, uh, I had planned on procrastinating all the way until April, uh, and then working on my presentation for all of April until uh, RailsConf came around. Now, unfortunately, we got hit with uh, uh, COVID-19 and RailsConf was canceled. And when that happened, uh, Evan texted me and he asked me, 
are, would you be willing to record your presentation? And of course I said yes. So uh, I asked him, well, what, when is the, you know, I need a deadline for this because that's how I work with my, I didn't tell him that this is my productivity strategy, but I need to have a deadline in order for me to procrastinate. Uh, and he said, oh yes, the, the dates will be the same as RailsConf. And I said, that is great. I knew internally, okay, the dates are the same. This means that my procrastination plan is on schedule. Uh, things can move like according to plan. So uh, unfortunately, maybe a couple weeks later, uh, I got an email from the RailsConf organizing committee saying to me, oh, well, actually, your videos are due, we want you to pre-record this, but your videos are due by April 13th. And unfortunately, this is three weeks earlier than I had planned. Uh, so this really, really put a lot of pressure on me. And I decided that part of my presentation, since, since now everything is pushed up so far, I thought, okay, well, part of my presentation is I'm going to uh, give a presentation of my planned procrastination projects. So before we actually dive into uh, technical details of my presentation. I'd like to show you some of the stuff that I've been doing to uh, basically put off doing my actual work. Uh, so once I found out that we were going to be doing RailsConf uh, as an online conference, that got me really worried. Uh, like I kept thinking to myself, okay, how am I how am I going to record the video? Uh, now, of course, like I need to record it in 4K. Uh, and obviously an iPhone won't do, uh, so I'm gonna have to purchase a new camera that has 4K, like can shoot 4K video, because it's very important that people uh, be able to see like, you know, how dry my skin is or <laughs> see my face in excruciating detail. Uh, so I decided to purchase a new camera. I got this camera, it's an Olympus uh, OM-D camera. It's a very nice camera. Uh, and then I read the manual for it, and to be honest, I haven't owned an SLR camera in quite a while, so I'm not up on the latest technology. And I was incredibly surprised at how you actually have to transfer, how you transfer photos from the camera onto, you know, your phone or your computer or whatever. According to the manual, what you do is uh, the Wi-Fi create, or the camera creates a Wi-Fi network. Now, you connect to the Wi-Fi network with your phone, uh, and then your phone transfers the photos off of the camera via Wi-Fi. Uh, so of course you have to install some kind of like proprietary application on your phone, some kind of app to transfer the photos from the phone over to your, or from the camera over to your phone. And this made me think a couple things. Like first off, I thought install a new app in this economy. I've got millions of apps on my phone. I can't afford to have another another app on my phone. Uh, the other thing that I thought is, can I hack this? There has to be a way for me. There has to be a way for me to uh, be able to hack my hack my camera. I don't want to transfer all of the photos off using some third party application. I'd rather have a program that uh, takes them directly off of the camera and imports them right into the photos application, rather than using some weird thing. So I decided that my, uh, one of my procrastination projects, I mean, since I, since I bought the camera to film the video, I need to be able to get the photos off of the camera or the video off of the camera in order to uh, show the video to everyone. I decided I needed to hack my camera. And to get started, I decided to connect my computer to the camera via Wi-Fi rather than my cell phone. And when I did, I noticed a couple of interesting things. First, uh, the camera always had the same IP address. So I thought that was, that was very interesting. And when I ran a port scan on the computer, I found that uh, it also had an HTTP service open. Uh, and that was very interesting. Now, I also found that I could just run curl against the HTTP port. It gave me an error. There was, there was an error that showed on the, in the terminal, uh, but the traffic was all over port 80. Uh, it was unencrypted. And if I could figure out what the actual endpoints were on the camera, like maybe I could write my own, write my own client for the camera. So I needed a way to figure out like, okay, what is the data going between the cell phone and the camera? What, what are they transferring? What is it doing? And if I can figure that out, I can write my own, write my own client. 
So I wanted to come up with a way to intercept the data that was being transferred between the camera and the phone. So there are a couple things going for me. The first thing was that uh, we had an, a hard-coded IP address. So the camera always had the same IP address and that uh, said to me that probably the application that's, that's accessing the camera is gonna have that IP address hard-coded in. So I can use this to my advantage. Uh, the other thing is that since we have port 80 open and not 443, it's probably gonna be unencrypted traffic. So the camera is gonna be uh, transmitting uh, unencrypted data. Now, there is one crucial detail or one important thing is that uh, this, the point of this exercise is not actually to write a client for the camera, but to uh, put off doing the work that I really need to do. Uh, and that means that I need to make this project uh, worthwhile so that I didn't feel guilty about it. And this gave me one really big constraint, and that is that I needed to either use Ruby or Rails to somehow intercept and deal with this traffic. Uh, so my idea for getting access to the data that was being transferred between the phone and the camera was to essentially set up two computers that each had two interfaces. So one computer would have uh, two computers, each computer would have Ethernet and Wi-Fi. Now, the two computers would be connected to each other via Ethernet uh, and will connect the cell phone to uh, one of the computers via Wi-Fi uh, and that computer will act as a proxy. So this computer is going to be intercepting the traffic and uh, recording it. Uh, then we'll connect the camera to the other computer via Wi-Fi uh, and create an SSH tunnel between the camera and the proxy server. Uh, this way our proxy server can access the network for the camera. So we can have the two, two, IP, two same IP addresses uh, with access to each other. So the secondary computer will set up an SSH tunnel between the camera and our proxy server, and then the proxy server can access the, access the camera through a uh, port on localhost. So when the phone sends data, the proxy server will uh, save a copy of the request, and when the camera responds, the proxy server can save a copy of the response, something like this. So the phone sends a request, we save a copy of the request, and then the camera sends a response, we save a copy of the response and send that back to the phone. And if we record all of that data, we can figure out what is the protocol that the phone and the camera are using to talk to each other. Now this is, for completeness, this is the SSH, uh, SSH tunnel uh, command that I used. And you can see here, essentially, what happens is we say we're gonna forward um, all, forward port 80 on 192.168.0.10 to our uh, Raspberry Pi, I'm using a Raspberry Pi as my um, proxy server, and the local the local host on the proxy server can or the proxy server can access the camera on localhost via port 2210. So if we connect to 2210 on localhost, that'll actually be forwarded over to the camera. Uh, then, in order to make this project worthwhile and make myself feel uh, guilt-free, I wrote the proxy server in Ruby. Uh, and essentially what it is is just a, um, a proxy server written with Webrick, and this is the, this is the uh, code that handles the GET request for uh, the proxy server. Essentially all it does uh, is access the SSH tunnel here, so when a request comes in, we, we uh, the proxy server, create a new connection to, lo to localhost on port 2210, which is actually a connection to the uh, camera. Uh, then we send the request, replay the request that we got from the phone. Uh, then we get the response body that came from the camera. Uh, and then we send the response body back to the, back to the phone, uh, logging all this data along the way. Uh, and then we have to handle posts as well. This is the code for handling posts. It's almost exactly the same as the code for handling gets, uh, except that we need to log post bodies as well. So it's very similar. Now, the next thing that I did was uh, use the app on the phone to collect data. Now, of course, yes, this did mean that I had to install the application on my phone. 
Uh, but hopefully I installed the application on my phone so that you don't have to. You too can buy this camera and not have to install the application. I did it for you um, and I am publishing this data. So you won't need to do this, hopefully. Anyway, using the data that uh, we're able to collect uh, that we intercepted on the proxy server, uh, it's pretty trivial to write our own client. Uh, and this is the client that I wrote for uh, uh, getting photos and getting images and movies off the camera. Basically, it just has two parts. Uh, the top part there just gets a list of all of the uh, images, all the files that are stored on the camera. And the second part just downloads all those, downloads all those images. And of course, I added a little bit of uh, intelligence in there so that if we've already downloaded the image, it won't try to download it again. So we did it. Our camera is hacked. That is great. Uh, of course, this is clearly not, not enough procrastination. This only took a couple of days. And uh, I just, after completing this project, I just didn't feel enough pressure to work on the presentation. Uh, so the next thing I had to do is I, I wanted to make a virtual conference inside of Animal Crossing and we saw the clip earlier today but that, that, that clip actually cost me a lot of time. I had to grind a lot on bells so that I could buy all the stuff to lay out and display for everybody. Uh, but then of course I needed a, I needed a way to um, record the video that came off of my Switch so that I could give the presentation in Animal Crossing. So I learned about that and by, I bought a video capture card so that I could record all the data from the Switch. Uh, and I had to figure out the right software to use to record it, which was extremely hard as well. Uh, now I also needed to get a tripod for the camera, but it was very difficult to get a tripod because it was very COVID outside. Uh, but the good news is that now that I've done all this yak shaving, I'm ready to become a Twitch gaming streamer. Uh, but this has all prepared me for my next, my next big career, which is to launch, my, launch myself into the great world of online game streaming. So when I decide to retire from programming, I can just play Animal Crossing online all day. Uh, the next project that I did, though, is... I, I still didn't feel enough pressure, even though I decided to start a new career in, in uh, streaming games. Uh, I decided to do something which I call the uh, Aaron Project. After hacking my camera, grinding, with, grinding for bells, dealing with capture cards, tripods, and starting my new career as an online streamer, since that wasn't enough, I, had to, I decided to design and build a sign to let me know every time I had done messed up. Uh, and this is, this is where I came up with the AA run sign. Essentially, I built a sign that sits in my office above my desk. This is, this is the sign. Uh, then I designed, an, I designed a PCB. This is the PCB. This PCB controls the sign. And the PCB has a serial UART connection. So I can hook this PCB straight into my computer and have my computer control the sign. Now, I've wired it up so that every time I execute a command in my terminal, if it fails, or if any of my tests fail, the sign will display AA run. So right here is the serial port on the PCB that I use to control it. Uh, and this sign will let me know any time I've messed up. Moving on, our main story tonight concerns where clauses in your active record queries. When you need to offload complexity to the database, uh, they're there for you. We're going to talk about how where clauses work in active record, uh, some features that you might not know about, uh, and then we're going to talk about profiling and speeding up, uh, speeding up where clauses. Now, when I say profiling, I don't mean profiling your application, I mean profiling Rails itself. Uh, certainly, these same profiling techniques, techniques can be used to profile your application, uh, but today we're going to look at how to speed up Rails itself. Now, this story started uh, a while back. We have an internal blog at work and somebody posted on the internal blog like, hey, check out this, check out this life hack. Uh, if you, basically the blog post just said like, 
sanitizing IDs yourself is much faster than letting Active Record sanitize the IDs for you. So if you have a large list of IDs and you need to do an in statement, uh, doing the sanitize SQL is way faster than asking the where clause to do it. And I read this and at first I, I just couldn't believe it. Um, and the next thing I thought is, well, if it's true, why would that be true? Uh, these two things do approximately the same thing. So why would you want to use the harder version uh, when you can just use the easy version? So in order to figure out what was going on, the first thing I did was uh, I wrote a very simple benchmark. Now this benchmark just compares the two different strategies using this great benchmark IPS gem. Uh, I really like this gem. Uh, because all it does is run the same code over and over again for five seconds and whichever chunk of code can run more times in five seconds that one is the faster version and this is really nice because I don't have to think about how many times should I run this thing uh, it just does it for me and sets a deadline and then however many times it executed within that deadline is our is our benchmark now uh, what this means is the more times you run, the faster your code is, so we want to have a higher iterations per second. Uh, our faster code will have higher iterations per second. Now, if we look at the results for this benchmark, uh, the results are incredibly surprising. Actually, sanitizing the IDs yourself was about 74% uh, faster than calling the easier, the easier API. Uh, and this really perplexed me. Why, why would this be the case? Uh, these two things are doing almost exactly the same thing. So how can the performance be so dramatically different? Now, before we dig into uh, this issue, uh, I wanna talk about using where with active record. So we're gonna do, we're gonna get a little bit back to basics here. Let's take a look at uh, calling the where method and how, what it actually does and the SQL queries that it generates. So with Active Record, the where method just is simply used to manipulate the where clause that's generated in your SQL statements. Uh, we use this method anytime we want to add constraints on the query we're making. Uh, and these, call, these calls are additive, so if we call where multiple times, it will add, uh, add multiple things to your where clause. So we can keep chaining where's and saying we want to add this and this and this and this. So from a high level perspective, we're translating Ruby calls into SQL. We're essentially taking the Ruby language and converting it into the SQL language. Uh, and there must be some process for converting Ruby code into SQL and executing it. Uh, if we look at our benchmark again, we'll see that the faster version is doing some of that translation to SQL manually. Uh, so we can kind of tell intuitively that the speed difference must come from the way that the uh, slower example does SQL generation. So something about the automatic SQL generation is slower than doing it manually. Uh, another interesting thing is that uh, if we look at this particular example in the console, uh, this isn't actually the SQL that gets generated. So we see the SQL, like we think it should be the SQL that gets generated, but when we look at the console, it's not, that's not the SQL that's actually generated. Uh, what's actually generated uh, is you'll see the same SQL statements, but they'll have a limit 11 attached to them. And this is because uh, Active Record is lazy about generating the query. Uh, so in fact, actually the inspect method uh, on Active Record will um, add this limit 11 to the query before it's executed. Uh, so if we want to have the where statement to generate the SQL that we would expect, we need to actually uh, proactively load them. Now this, uh, if we look at these three calls, we'll notice a difference between the behavior uh, where the first one, when we eagerly load, when we call to A, no limit is added. Uh, if we call just dot all without inspecting it, nothing gets executed and nothing's executed because we didn't access any of the records. Uh, and we didn't uh, do anything with it, so nothing is executed. Now the third one, it adds limit 11, and that's because uh, we called the inspect method on it. And remember that the console will call inspect for us, or calling P will automatically call inspect. Now, the important thing to learn from this is we actually wrote our benchmark incorrectly. Uh, if we look at our benchmark, we'll see that uh, we're just calling where, uh, and we're not actually loading any records, so uh, neither of these things will actually query the database. 
so the only thing that we've proven is that um, we're able to do nothing faster when we call sanitize SQL than if we were just calling where. Uh, so let's fix the benchmark. And now we, we, here we fix the benchmark to uh, generate a thousand IDs and then try and query for those thousand IDs. And it actually hits the database. And if we compare that again, if we run, rerun this benchmark, uh, we'll see that uh, in fact, um, before we before we fix the benchmark, the where statement was uh, or the sanitized SQL statement it was seventy percent faster. Uh, now that we fi fixed the benchmark, we can see that well it's only sixty percent faster now. So we've sped up our we've sped up our program, but rather than being seventy percent faster, it's now sixty percent faster. So I guess that's better, but uh, ideally these two things should be identical. Uh, so let's profile, let's actually profile this code and try and figure out what's going on. Uh, for these two pieces of code, the, these two pieces of code doing most of the same thing, being 60% slower is just, it's too slow. It's in the threshold of something that I would consider to be a bug. Uh, so let's try to figure out what the bottleneck of this code is. And to figure that out, I, I like to use a tool called Stackprof for profiling. Uh, this is an example usage of StackProf. So this is using StackProf to profile these two, uh, our two benchmark issues, or our two benchmark pieces of code. It looks very similar to the IPS uh, code we saw earlier, only this time we're just doing, getting profiling information. Now, what we're doing here is uh, we're generating actually two profiles. One is with our slow case and one is with our fast case. And I like, in this particular case, I like to generate two profiles because we need to, I want to compare them uh, and it can be helpful to compare the two. So if we run this, we'll end up with two, two profile files, one for the fast case and one for the slow case. Uh, and if we run stackprof against the where profile, our slow case, uh, and we look at the top six stack frames, we'll see that approximately 14% of our time is being spent querying the database. Now, querying the database, like normally, this might be our target for optimization. So if we were just doing profiling on a web app, say, for, for example, uh, maybe we see that we're spending 14% of our time in one particular method, well, we would probably want to target that method. Now, let's take a look at the profile with manual sanitization, or fast case. The top stack frames for the fast case, well, they, they look almost identical to the frames we saw in the slow case. Now, this means that if we were to go in and speed up that query method, uh, we would actually be speeding up both cases, and that's not what we want. We want to figure out why is one case faster than the other, and can we, can we get those two bits of code to be the same speed? Uh, so speeding up the query method in this case won't actually help achieve our goal. Uh, now, we can figure out, like, as we see these, these profiles, they're not really helping us so much because uh, we, don't, like, we don't know what the difference is. Looking at the two, they're, they're essentially the same. So why is one faster than the other? We haven't been able to answer that question. Now, these profiles, when we're reading them, they're telling us how much time we're spending in any one particular function call. Uh, and we call this self. So this is this, that one call we're saying, how much time do we spend in ourselves? versus ourselves and other things that we call, other functions that we call. Well, uh, StackProf also measures the amount of time that uh, your, this one particular function takes plus all of its children as well. So we call that uh, self plus children. So, so far we've looked at uh, the amount of time or what the slowest functions are, uh, but that only tells us how much time a particular function takes uh, it doesn't tell us how much time that function takes plus all the functions it calls. Now, where this is important is, let's say, let's take a look at an example. So in this particular case, uh, if we profiled this code, the profiler would tell us, oh, the method, the slow method, the method named slow, it is the slowest. Um, and you should speed that up. And it's true, that method is the slowest. Uh, and this slow caller method, it wouldn't even show up on profiles because we don't spend any time in that method. So the profiler would say, hey, you need to speed up the slow method, this method named slow. Now, uh, it would be even better though if we could eliminate the slow caller method. Like maybe, maybe we don't need to call slow caller so much, maybe we, we can just eliminate that method altogether. 
but we can't see the slow caller method in our profiler outputs. So what we need to do is say, stackprof, I want you to sort by the total amount of time that is spent inside of a function. So we, we say, hey, sort by total. Uh, we can say stackprof pass in the sort total flag, and this will sort by uh, sort functions by how much time is spent in that function plus any functions it calls. So if we sort by that, uh, we'll get a profile for our slow case that looks something like this. And the, this is actually much more interesting than the previous profile we looked at. And the reason is, if we look through it, we can see where are we spending all of our time. Well, actually, we're spending approximately 28% uh, or 29% uh, inside of this compile method inside of the two SQL visitor. So this is, this is actually very interesting. Why are we spending 30% of our time compiling SQL? Now, if we compare this profile to the self-sanitization profile, that arrow to SQL visitor, it doesn't even show up at all. So here we found our difference between the two. So in our slow case, we're spending nearly 30% of our time in this compiler, where in our fast case, uh, we don't even see that compiler in the profile output. So it's not that we're not spending time in the compiler in the fast case, it's just that we don't spend much time in the compiler in the fast case. So we can tell from the, comparing these two profiles that our actual target is this uh, two SQL visitor or this two SQL compile. So we need to figure out like, why is this method taking up so much of our time? Uh, but uh, maybe we can speed up that method. But I think it's better to step back a little bit and say, you know, what, what exactly is this method doing? So let's take a look at uh, some active record design. Uh, to understand what that compile method is doing, I want to look at a little bit of Active Records design. Specifically, I want to look at uh, SQL generation. SQL generation in Active Record uh, involves a few, a few steps. Uh, our first step is generating relation objects. Now, every time we call any type of query builder method in Active Record, we're generating, we're creating a new relation object. So each time we call like say where or order or joins or any of these types of query builder methods, we're creating a new relation object. And that relation object contains uh, information about constraints or things that we want to add to the SQL statement. So in this case, we're saying, hey, we wanna, uh, we wanna find cats that are age 10 uh, with names Gorbian and we want you to order them by ID. And each of these relation objects stores that particular information. The nice thing about this design is that we can reuse these relation objects. So we can say, okay, uh, I want you to find all cats that are age 10 and I want you to order them by ID. And then we can actually split and say, well, in this case, I want you to order, I want you to find cats named Gorby. And in this case, I want you to find cats named SeaTac. But we're able to reuse part of the query uh, between both of those two. Now, uh, this gives us a nice ability to reuse relations and refactor our, refactor our designs. So uh, our next step is actually Active Record takes these relation objects and converts them into an AST. This AST, what an AST is, is simply a tree data structure that represents uh, the SQL query that we want to execute. So if we were to imagine the object relationship of this uh, AST, it would look something like this. Uh, this is what the data structure might actually look like. It's a tree of objects. So say we have a statement object, it points at a fields object, and the field object points at a list of fields it wants to query. And this tree structure represents the actual string below it. Now, Active Record will go through, look at each of those relation objects, and convert them into an AST that represents the SQL statement that we're going to execute. So maybe the tree will look uh, something like this. Now, uh, we can actually view these or get access to this AST by calling some extremely internal APIs. Now, the, these APIs are very internal, but I'm, and they may break at some point in the future, but they are very handy when you're trying to debug stuff, especially this kind of performance issues. Uh, if we call .arrow.ast on the relation, we can actually get access to that uh, AST object. So calling this will give us the top of that tree and we can traverse through the tree and check out the actual uh, tree that represents our SQL statement. Uh, or we can call to dot, and this prints out our tree in graphviz.format. 
That graph is dot format looks like this. So this is the dot output. Uh, it's actually a bit longer, so the, it, this is the whole thing, and of course it depends on the relation that you've created in the SQL statement that you're trying to execute. Now, this isn't very helpful, uh, but if we take this dot format and run it through the dot command line tool, graph is command line tool, we can generate a PNG file that shows us the actual structure of the SQL statement. Uh, so in this case, uh, where we're querying for cats, the output of GraphViz will look like this. So this is the, the actual uh, structure of the SQL statement that we're going to be executing. Uh, if we zoom in, we can see the column name. So we have name and age. Um, and we can also see the uh, table that we're executing against, as well as the columns and order information that we want to query, with, query against as well. Uh, now our final step before sending the query to the database is actually generating, a, generating that SQL statement, that string. Uh, and to do that, we're just taking this AST, this tree data structure, and we're gonna walk the tree and convert the tree into a literal string that we'll send to the database. So we have a bit of code that's called a visitor. It's using the, what is called the visitor pattern. Uh, this SQL visitor will walk through every one of these nodes in the tree converting each node into a string, or each node into a bit of a SQL statement and concatenating all of them together. And then we send that string to the database. So this is, uh, this, so this particular visitor here is generating a SQL statement where what we saw on the previous slide was actually a graph viz visitor that walks the tree and outputs the tree to um, a dot file that we can use with graph viz. Now this is very interesting because uh, when we were looking at our profiles earlier, our target is the arrow visitor to SQL visitor. It is exactly that. It is that code that's walking through this tree. Now we, we know from our profiles that this is the bottleneck uh, and that's the thing that we need to figure out why it's taking so long. So we know that the difference in performance is something to do with the difference in the ASTs that are being generated. So let's compare the AST for each of these queries. So we'll generate dot files for uh, our case that uses sanitized SQL, our fast case, and we'll generate a dot file for our case that doesn't use sanitized SQL, and we'll compare the two. So this here is the output for the AST, or this is the AST that is the uh, fast case. This is where we use sanitized SQL. Now, uh, let's compare that to the AST for our slow case where we're not using sanitized SQL. This is what it looks like. And we can see here that this auto sanitized version is actually much different than our sanitized SQL version. If we add more IDs to the, to the, uh, the auto sanitized version, then this array will keep growing and growing and growing in size. And we know that we will have more and more nodes to process as we're walking this tree and converting it into an AST. And this actually uh, really, this actually coincides or works well with the, um, uh, the performance that we're seeing. If we compare the performance between the self-sanitization or the manual sanitization and the auto-sanitization, we can see that, well, our auto-sanitization auto is spending about 29% of our time generating a SQL statement where our self-sanitization is only spending 0.6% of our time. So we can see that there's a huge difference between these two, but we can also see that there's a huge difference between the ASTs. So these numbers correlate. It makes sense. We have a large AST. It takes a large time. Uh, uh, we have a large AST, and it takes a long amount of time to uh, generate that query. So, how can we fix this? Well, we have a few options. Uh, we could speed up the compiler. Uh, that's one option. But again, this would actually speed up both the fast and the slow cases. So, our our fast case would get faster. Our slow case would get faster too. Uh, but that's not what we want. We actually want to have our slow case be the same speed as our fast case. So maybe instead we could do less work. Uh, our faster example is doing much less work. So maybe there's a way that we could reduce the amount of work that our slow case is, is um, doing. So maybe there's a way that we could take this where call and have it just call sanitize SQL uh, rather than uh, going through the entire compiler. Now, if we trace through the trace through these uh, profiling frames, we'll actually find the find the point where 
uh, these relations are being converted into IDs or into an AST. And that this is the code that converts those uh, relations into a list of IDs in the AST. And we can see here that essentially what we're doing is we're creating an in node and this in node points at all the IDs that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be using in the AST. It would be nice if instead of generating so many nodes, we could just generate a sanitized SQL part right here, just call sanitized SQL and we don't generate all those nodes to walk. Of course, it'll require a little bit of refactoring to get it to work, um, but I have to say like when I encounter some code that I need to refactor, I always ask myself the same three questions. Can I refactor this code? Should I refactor this code? And do I want my name on the blame? If I answer yes to all three of these questions, then I'll refactor this code. Otherwise, I need a different strategy. Eileen and I worked on optimizing this code for about three months, and it seems like it should be a fairly straightforward optimization, but unfortunately it wasn't. And that's because there are some subtle differences between the ways that the, the two code examples work. Uh, the first issue is that we can't use the parameters hash and controllers the same way that with manual sanitization in the same way that we would with auto sanitization. So for example, here we have params that may have come in from the controller and we pass those parameters into active record. Now, uh, if we look at the queries that are generated by these two statements, we can see that they're totally different. The first one casts it to an ID, whereas the second one leaves it a string and generates an in clause with the string. So this is because um, the AST has some context about the values that are being put into the SQL statement. It knows, oh, we're going to be generating, we're, we're dealing with IDs here, IDs are integer types, so we need to cast this value to an integer type, and it does that for us automatically, whereas the sanitized SQL version doesn't have that context. Another example is URL slugs. Uh, say we have some type of text that comes after the ID that, com on, that comes in from the controller. Now, when this ID comes in, what, what will the query look like? Uh, if we look at the SQL statements, we'll see using auto sanitization, it does the right thing. It queries with a value of 100 for the ID, whereas the manual sanitization will not do that. It generates uh, an in clause uh, with that string literal. Now, again, this is because uh, the auto sanitization has that context. It knows that we need to convert these into IDs. Now the third issue is uh, very large numbers. So in this case, we, we have a very large number and we're trying to do a query against the database with it. If we look at the SQL statement that's generated here, we'll see that in fact, the first one doesn't do any query, it does nothing. Where the second one does a very, an in statement with a very large number, uh, where this could raise an exception or something. And the reason that the first one doesn't do any, doesn't do a query is because it knows, well, this number is outside of the bounds that this particular value can handle. So I won't do any query, I'll return an empty set. So to deal with this or try to, try to speed this thing up, the solution that we came up to, came up with was to introduce a new type of node called a precompiled node. Uh, part of the reason the compiler is slower than we'd like is because it's designed to deal with any type of node in the tree, but when application code is calling the where function, we know that at that point, we are being called with a list of IDs and we can do something a little bit more intelligent. So the compiler is much more general, it knows about general issues, whereas at that point when we call where, at that call site, we know that we're only dealing with a list of IDs. So what we could do is at the point where we create that list, rather than creating that list of IDs, we can create a precompiled node that has the SQL statement we need to uh, insert. So normally our tree will contain an in node that points to a bunch of IDs, and we know that walking those IDs is our bottleneck. So what we aim to do is instead introduce a type of precompiled node. This precompiled node will point at the old in statement, uh, but it will also point at generated SQL that we can use when we're compiling our SQL statement. 
Now, the reason we point at both of these is so that we can maintain backwards compatibility. For example, maybe we need to change the in statement into a not in statement. So we need to do some kind of transformation on the tree. Well, we're able to maintain backwards compatibility and get higher performance. So normally during the compilation phase, we would normally visit these, um, all these in statements or all the nodes in this inside of the tree. Whereas now when we encounter a pre-compiled node, instead of visiting all of those, we can just say, okay, I wanna use this pre-compiled statement. So uh, Eileen and I implemented this and I wanna share some of the benchmark results with you. So if we look at the performance difference, so this benchmark just measures how fast can we execute a where statement uh, and we're comparing against our, our branch to master, we'll see that our branch is actually 30% faster. So we've been able to improve performance on master 30 by 30%. Now we need to compare this with the original benchmark uh, against self-sanitization to see where, where we are with regard to self-sanitization. So we compare that as well using a thousand IDs and if we run the benchmarks we'll see here it's still actually slower. It's 18% slower than doing self-sanitization. Now I think this is good news because it used to be 60% uh, slower. Uh, of course we saw earlier that these two functions are doing something a little bit different uh, so we're not exactly comparing apples to apples, so that could be that could be the reason for this performance degradation. But actually, I think that we still have a lot of work to do. Uh, this is a work in progress, and I think that we can actually get those numbers closer, such that there is no performance difference at all. Uh, but for the time being, I think this is a great improvement. Now, I'd like to show you all of the source code for this. Uh, the entire diff for fixing this particular issue, but I think that that would be going from zero to drawn owl when actually I want to communicate to you things that would be more useful to you in your daily lives, uh, like the architecture of active record or uh, benchmarking and profiling techniques. Those are the things that I actually want to communicate to you in this talk versus the, this one particular performance fix. Uh, now, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you some of the actual patch, so let's take a look at it. Uh, this is the bit of the code that handles AST conversion, uh, where we are looking at in, we are generating in nodes, and we went from this uh, to eager compilation to this. Now, the first thing you'll notice about this code is it's more complicated. That is true. But you can see under the hood that we're actually just calling this sanitized SQL array just like our fast example was doing. Now, actually, this isn't merged into master yet, and the reason is we have our, the main issue with this particular patch is we have this neat function here called uh, serialize2. Now, we need to figure out a better name for this method. In fact, what we had to do to get this performance boost is if you look at the internals of active record, you'll see that each type has a serialize method. Now, that serialize method actually has it doesn't just serialize, unfortunately. It has two responsibilities. It does um, uh, verification and uh, serialization. So it checks to see if the value is within bounds and then it does the serialization. Well, in this patch, we, we needed to be able to split up that functionality. So we needed to be able to uh, do those checks, say, are these things in bounds, and then do the serialization or uh, do the serialization. Unfortunately, serialize is a public method, so we can't change the behavior of that method. So we just, for the time being, we introduced a method called serialize2. So we need to figure out a better name for that. Uh, but once we do, we'll merge this in, or we'll just make this private or something. We'll figure out something, but for now we have this fun method name. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's wrap this up. First thing I wanna say is that not all code is equal. We saw those two, those two bits of code at the very beginning and we saw that they did basically the same thing, but in fact, they're not equal at all. Uh, they handle different cases and this manual sanitization route may not be applicable in the same cases as these regular active record calls. So it's kind of dangerous to say like, okay, these, these two things are the same. They're probably not exactly the same. However, Similar behavior should have similar performance, but these weren't even the same. The performance was very different. 
The performance should be very close. If they do approximately the same thing, the performance should be approximately the same. But in this case, they weren't even close at all. It was very different. So I would consider this poor performance to be a bug. I think that poor performance is a bug. If you encounter something like this with Rails, you should absolutely report it as an issue rather than saying it's you know, just a performance pro tip. It's cool to have performance pro tips like that, but really we should be working to make the framework faster. I mean, if you really think about it, like poor performance in this economy, we can't afford that. And you're right, we can't afford that. We need to be fixing these things. So to recap, today we looked at really great ways to procrastinate. I verified them as really great. We looked at tools for performance, active record internals and design. And I hope that you all enjoyed my very first opening keynote at RailsConf. Thank you so much. And I really hope that we can actually see each other in person next year. Thank you again.